All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, let's look at the four employees reactions to Cooper's painting. And I'd like to, um, to make a note that they're pretty typical of a lot of museum goers. Uh, the first girl we're going to look at, she is sort of our average museum goer. And she looks at it for about three seconds. She shrugs and she says, so it's smudgy squares, huh? That's interesting. And then she turns away without seemingly being affected by the art. She represents the average museum goer who spends a minimal amount of seconds in front of an artwork. Um, and she doesn't really exercise her brain too hard to figure out what there is to the smudgy squares. In fact, three seconds is about the average time that anybody spends in front of artwork in a museum. In fact, the Mona Lisa, um, there was a study done where museum goers don't really spend much more than 15 seconds looking at the Mona Lisa, which is one of the most famous pieces of artwork. So she's pretty average. But then we have um, sort of like the frustrated viewer. And that is uh, Harry, the guy that's actually, you know, really concerned about what's the right thing to say about the artwork. And he's trying to figure out the right answer to the painting. He is concerned not so much about the painting itself, but rather about the way his reaction to the painting will make him appear to his boss. He hopes that there is some sort of brochure or something that'll help him understand the painting um, so he can get the right answer if there is one. This reaction captures how anxious modern art can make some people feel because it is not overtly beautiful or stunning. Some people feel um, that they're afraid to see art for what it is and they're afraid to take the time to really to really think about it. They're just concerned about, you know, how does their reaction make them look? Then we had the art director who made a few comments. Um, he claims that the painting must mean something and he uses his own knowledge of as an experience as an artist to defend this. Often, this is how one creative person looks at the work produced by another creative person. Artists are driven by mysterious forces to make art, and sometimes they hardly understand these forces, even as they are happening. One of my favorite artists, Marina Abramovich, do you remember the lady who sat in the chair for three months? Um, she once hired a psychoanalyst to talk with her for four days to help her understand what drove her to make her art. Um, so it's perhaps natural for creative people to try to understand and look for what sparks other creative people's work. They tend to get very caught up on discovering the artist's intentions. To be honest, I find myself in this category quite a bit. I'm always really interested in what made people create certain things. What was their, um, their inspiration? So, um, the next reaction, the last gentleman, um, speaks about the Mark Rothko painting and he represents the ideal museum goer who is not set out to judge the artwork, but is rather willing to take the time to let the artwork move and affect him. He suggests that maybe the painting doesn't mean anything, but maybe you're just supposed to experience it. Wow. He explains that when you take the time to look at it, you feel something. And he's absolutely right. Rothko was brilliant at creating these unique experiences for viewers. He created paintings that were bigger than people so that when viewers stood in close proximity to them, the colors would sort of swallow people and affect their sense of reality. We will discuss um, this quite a bit more when we get to the section about the color fieldists at the end of this presentation. So the last reaction we see is the investor, Bert Cooper. He's the man who purchased the painting. Um, and this is the last person to give us a clue as to why these smudgy squares are worth so much. Cooper does not talk about appreciating anything about the art, such as its beauty or deeper meaning. Instead, what, he, what does he value about the painting? He values the economic value. He is a businessman. And all he ultimately cares about is how he will get a huge return on his investment. Not to mention, um, as the time at the time of his purchase, 
the artist was still alive. So when the artist dies in six years, the worth of that painting will skyrocket. In fact, in just 50 years, the painting could sell for over $80 million, as we saw. Um, and then just for kicks and giggles, let's see if we've actually gotten any better at guessing the worth of paintings here. Um, so I have for you now a Willem de Kooning painting. Notice it's from about the same time period, 1955. That was kind of a hot era for American art in general. Um, I want you for number six to make a guess as to how much this sold for in 2015. So just to remember, the Mark Rothko painting sold for um, over $80 million. How much do you think this painting sold for? You ready for the actual price? Here it is. The actual price is three hundred and four million dollars that is nuts so try to wrap your brain around that and then we're going to continue on to section two to learn about um what were the rules of art history and who first broke those rules um and in case you missed it on number five it asks you um, which of those five characters best describe the way that you would react to this painting? And so in case you needed it again, here's the list. You could just write down the bold name of how I've described them here. The average museum goer, the frustrated viewer, the artist, the open-minded viewer, or the investor.